following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies if it involves puts and calls then our all-star panel will break it down down. it's time to hit the option block with your hosts mark longo from the optionsinsider.com mark sebastian from optionpit.com mike tusa from knowyouroptionsinc.com and john grigas from options express Welcome back to the Option Block. Despite what you may have heard last week, the rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. It was touch and go there for a while, but I pulled through in the end from a very severe, surprisingly severe battle with with the old flu. You know, I, I kind of saw it coming. The writing was on the wall because we one by one, everybody on our team was getting struck down by this thing, and, and my little guy got it, and my wife got it, and I knew... It was coming for me eventually, and I fought it as long as I could, and it finally got me on Sunday. And just a word of warning for all of our listeners, if you start feeling weird, sharp pains in your stomach, then uh, then just clear your calendar for the next couple of days because you're, you're not going anywhere and uh, you're not doing much. You're in for a rough couple of days. But uh, yeah, you guys, you guys pulled off an admirable show without me. Oh, it was it, it was nothing. All right, a show without Mark Lago is like a day without the sun. Yeah, the day happens, but nobody's really really pleased about it. You know. <laughs> yeah, if Mr. Tusa was here, I would I would congratulate him on his excellent hosting duties. I feel comfortable now leaving the show in his capable hands. Unfortunately, Mr. Tussaw is is on rush advisor assignment. I think one of his clients called up at the last minute with exploding puts that he needed addressed right away. And so so Mike had to run off there. That, that tinny voice you heard before was, of course, the greasy meatball himself, Mark Sebastian. Hey. So from OptionPit.com and many other ventures, recording live from the Money Show in Las Vegas right now as we speak. Yeah, I'm actually going to go around. Uh, I was thinking about going around the Money Show. I've got my little handheld recorder and uh, recording up some really fun content for uh, for shows in the future that, that might be fun to listen to. The Rotating Options Express seat is filled today by our regular guest star, Tim Navabi. Tim, how you doing? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. I don't think we've had you on since the live show, so it's good to have you back. That's right. Yes, thank you. And with that, I think we will dive right into the trading block. The trading block. Welcome to the Trading Block. As always, this is the segment of the show where we discuss some of the interesting general economic activity and general market activity that we're seeing today. And, of course, it was a day when the bulls were back in force. The S&P closed up about 18 handles, Dow about 173. VIX Cash closed at 1888, down 2.88. I almost did it myself. I almost said $2.88. So it's easy, easy, easy to fall into that trap. It really is. And then uh, GLD, Mike's favorite, closed at 132.09, up buck seventy one. You know, most of the most of the bulls seem to be rallying today because of the talks that Ireland's going to get a bailout. So we also had some uh, a smaller than expected increase in jobless claim numbers. I believe the number was up two thousand versus expected up five thousand. So that was. A slightly bullish sign. And we also had some surprise manufacturing surge in some of the data that we just saw coming out. So a number of mildly bullish things kind of came together to create a, a bullish surge. We also had the the long-awaited IPO of GM finally. I know the guys on the NYSE were, uh, were cheering and quite excited to see a, a real IPO coming in and, and getting some action today. And I know Tim has a lot to say about that, so we're going to table the discussion of GM for right now for until we get to the, the old express slash spread block. 
Of course, surprisingly, mm -hmm. Ford did not follow suit. I, I was kind of a little surprised that the rest of the the car manufacturers didn't well, get, at least feel the love. You know, I thought it was if there was probably some migration of, of, of funds, and that would probably be why. So, you have some people that uh, were all in Ford. Ford's had a massive run up. I mean, if you bought Ford, you know, of course, I don't listen to my my. If I listened to my own advice. I was driving the car with my dad, and it's before GM declared bankruptcy. I said, "Well, what do you think about GM for a buck thirty? He goes, "Well, what about Ford for like a dollar five? And I said, "Oh, you gotta buy that. I don't think they're going bankrupt." And he goes, "Yeah, I think I will." So I bought five thousand shares, and I did not. And, uh, <laughs> you gotta be nice to him, so you're in the will. Exactly. Well, <laughs> Dad's okay. Dad's sitting pretty right now. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. There's a reason why he's retired and I'm not. So Thanksgiving uh, dinner is at Dad's place this year, I take it, then. Oh, you know it. You, you know it. Um, but, yeah, Ford has had a substantial run. They're up about 30% just in the past month, month and a half. So definitely makes sense just to see some selling activity out there in general. Yeah, and, and Ford had some really cool volatility structure going on. And um, I'm not going to talk about GM here, but uh, one of the interesting things about Ford is that there was a big surge this week. Uh, at the beginning of the week in upside call buying, so much so that um, by Tuesday afternoon, uh, Ford upside was higher vol than Ford at the monies. And, you know, for a kind of old school equity stock that isn't like a biotech that's expecting like a major announcement to come out, to have higher implied volatility in its upside out of the money relative to the at the monies, yeah, that's pretty much unheard of these days. Really unusual, yeah. I mean, think about this. Um, even now, you can buy the 17, 18, 1 by 2 call spread and collect, all right, in December. All right, so that means you buy 17, sell 18, uh, you collect cash on it, and you can't lose money on that trade unless Ford blows through um, $19. That would be a gain of over 10% in the next 29 days. Something that I, you know, I, I find kind of hard to believe at this point after a run-up like that. Uh, if you believe in a, in a kind of a slow forward climb, I, I think it's a beautiful little play. And they've got other ones like that in January. I saw the 17 and a half, 19 you could do. A uh, few other really cool plays like that where uh, you can get long this sucker and be in a pretty favorable position, um, you know, it was there's some really interesting structure when you when anytime you see uh you know here's what I, I would tell people listening anytime you see a situation where upside calls are cheaper than at the money you have to find some way to sell it um now you don't have to overweight it you can buy ads and sell outs and then buy something cheap uh you know that's not really vol when you buy you know a cheap nickel option but i found that it is really hard to lose if you buy ads and sell more expensive out of the monies. Um, you guys have any thoughts on that? Wait, you say it again. So you're buying, buying buy at, yeah. When you have cheaper vol at the money, you buy at the monies and then sell a out greater amount monies. out of the monies. Gotcha. Yeah, you, you could do great. You know, it doesn't necessarily even have to be a greater amount. Um, you know. You, if you are selling higher higher vol to the upside, then you can buy at the money. Whatever trade you set up will be in a favorable position. It may not definitely win, okay? But, you know, the first, one of the first things they taught me when I was learning to trade is this is a game of coin flips, nickels, and seconds. So if you can make that coin flip a little more in your favor and you can collect some extra nickels, over time those bets will make you a lot of money. Yeah, I think that's one to where you're definitely putting yourself in a good position, assuming you know, there's going to be exceptions to the rules, obviously. But as the market goes higher, if, if vol in general goes lower, then you're putting yourself in a, in a good position because you already sold the higher vol, if indeed the higher vol was out of the money, as you're describing. So I think that's definitely, uh, as a, once again, you're not always going to make money doing that, obviously. But I think no. that is one with which you're definitely trying to put the odds in your favor and thinking, so to speak. Right. Favorable trades. You know, that's the key, right? Favorable trades. 
Well, one thing with that, there's if you like the underlying stock, there's no sin in buying the stock and combining it with a one by two ratio spread. A lot of people view the one by two as a stock repair strategy, but I have no qualms at all about putting that on as the initial move in the stock. I should mention for the listeners who are confused that we have been joined in progress by Mr. Tussaud, who managed to uh, to pull himself away from that emergency client meeting at the last minute and, and join us today. And by the way, Mike, I wanted to say excellent job on last week's show. Uh, t- tough shoes to fill, that's for sure. Your job's much harder than this job, that's for sure. I had a tear in my eye listening to it. It was so beautiful. We talked a, l- a week ago. Uh, Mark, I'm not sure if you were if you were on the show or not for this one about oh maybe I think you were because we discussed how the 30 year rate had hit 4.17 was the lowest Fannie Mae had ever seen and we've since seen a bit of a climb off that I'm not sure if any of you guys researched into that a little more after that show but I went and uh, and contacted a few of our mortgage brokers and I said hey what can you get me I spoke to them again just recently just yesterday just to see what the rates were and it it was. One of those, I, I kind of like expected a very quick touch to the bottom and then a quick mm-hmm. rally back up. You know, the best you can do on a 30 year is probably four and seven eighths, maybe five around there. And it looks like the numbers from, from Fannie Mae now are backing that up. They say their studies showing that it gapped up to about the average rate of about 4.4, up from 4.17. If you were one of the few who had the hanging bit out there for a 30 year <laughs> down way down in like four and a quarter four and three eighths and you might have gotten filled down there but other than that very few people were able to actually grab that gorgeous the rate. only thing i did that day i actually went down the federal reserve and unloaded um you know just over a billion and a half in in 30 years selling them that works yeah, too that it. works those too were, those <laughs> worked pretty well for me so uh, you know if you want to know why your the rates popped it was because i stepped in you know you, you know you're <laughs> You've heard of, of the, uh, you know, QE2. This is uh, Greasy Meatball 2. It's it's a GM 2. It's the Sebastian effect all over again. Damn you, Sebastian. You bought more of your TBT, didn't you? <laughs> I, 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 am, I have backed up the truck on TV after TBT, folks. It is unbelievable. The only other thing I have, my portfolio consists of three things. Short VXX, long TBF, long TBT. So... That's that's what I look like right now. And Mike, before we go, I know I mentioned GLD. We, let's, let's toss it to you then. You and Tim, you guys are both the commodity guys. Give our listeners a quick commodity roundup of what you guys saw out there in gold and silver today. You you must be happy with a little bit of bump back in, in gold. It was. And uh, you know, before I get into gold, I got three words that describe the that I thought described the U.S. stock market today. And the three words are 1,200, 1,200, 1,200. Uh, the SPX just is not what it got past 1200 for a couple of brief moments today but i think 1200 is definitely a key number uh to watch tomorrow is that if the market just ran up and stopped right at 1200 throughout the whole day today so uh those are my three little words so to speak on the stock market but uh, in regard to gld we actually had an opportunity last week to ratchet up our collar and uh we were excited about that so uh right now it's one to wear uh, it is good to have a little bit of a bump in it. 130 is a pretty key number also for GLD. I think that uh, just in looking at the chart on it, if it, if it, if it breaks through 130, uh, I think we could have a pretty decent-sized sell-off. I and mean, you never know. That's why we like to have puts on things because we never claim to know. But uh, with it, I think 130 has definitely been a, a pretty tough number for GLD to crack. Um. You know, my story is a little bit different, um, and, you know, I'm dealing more with the individual uh, traders um, relying, you know, on their own research and their own uh, knowledge and experience, um, and uh, what, you know, I'm seeing a lot of is, is people going long, um, going long in silver futures, going long in gold futures, um, in addition to some crude oil. Um, People are both going long and short in the crude. Um, the uh, December contract finished yesterday. Um, it seemed to have hit some support around the 80 mark. Now we're in the January. Um, so we were um, starting the day around 81. Um, and <clears throat> essentially, you know, you have some people going long in crude oil and some people going short. Uh, but as far as the metals, um, we have mostly people. Uh, you know, going long. Uh, Tim, quick, quick question for you. You know, you mentioned that you have a lot of people doing crude and the gold. 
What kind of interest have you seen in the uh, the mini future contract out of OA, OX clients, just out of curiosity? People love uh, the mini crude oil. Um, no complaints there. Um, okay. As far as the mini metals contracts, mm -hmm. they like them for a while. I thought the mini metals um, contracts was a, uh, a small, was a hairband of... Uh, of uh, you know, little people dedicated to uh, <laughs> dedicated to warrant. Hey, mark, mark your mark your clocks. I think we're about twenty minutes in for the first '80s <laughs> reference from Mark Sebastian. Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's you, you didn't see you never seen mini metals contract. They did a they do uh, they do uh, a big a big set of uh, warrant. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, what's what's Sebastian by <laughs> Mr. Big? And, uh, I, I thought they other, opened for poison back in the eighties. They, they they did they did. <laughs> so yeah no you know, it's like well you've seen mini kiss this is mini mini metals contract that's what they do so they uh, they rock out on their guitars and uh, I, my understanding is they're also traders. Actually you know what the the, the Merc could do the Merc could do worse than to uh, you know ha do something like that as a marketing campaign. I know I'd buy into it. Hey, the Merck's I know Mike Tusa. But... The Merck's looking for any way to get people to to dive into the metals world, so or the futures options world. So hey, maybe that's a good idea. You should pitch that to them. People are generally attracted to the mini metals um, until there's a day of volatility, um, until their stops get blown through and they get canceled by the exchange, or they start to work as limits because there's all sort of little rules um, that the exchange has to, so I, 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 you know, I, I'm not sure really what the reason is. I mean, to make it more friendly, um, I'm not sure if you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, but if you've ever had, you know, stops blown through on some of these mini metals, um, you know, there's a certain price band where the exchange won't, uh, you know, fill the order. Um, and that's, you know, primarily due to some of the smaller volume and, and you know, wider spreads, um, smaller, you know, liquidity. Um, but, you know, they get very frustrated on that. Um, but as far as the mini crude oil contracts, people really like that contract. And they trade it a lot. And they, they, I never hear any complaints about it. Well, it makes sense. You know, people need a, a nice bite-sized contract to get into some of those products. And if, if there's going to be something that will compete with the ETF stuff, it's going to be those those mini contracts. They just need to start adding more of them. Tim, how are the like the e micros? Are they getting a lot of any attention over at Options Express? The e micros, as far as those currencies, yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, and some of the traders that I've seen trade them, they do like them. Um, they have been making money with them, um, but I think it's still a product that is not very um, attracted, attractive to, you know, somebody who just wants a straight currency pair, um, or, you know, they just want to buy the call or the put, you know, on the currency itself. Um, you know, you're buying a contract of a pair, and I think that that has a tendency to confuse people. Um, gotcha. But, but there are some people here who are trading them. Um, but the majority of people who trade currencies, they you know, they want to trade a currency pair. Um, you know, they want the forex, you know, interbank market. Um, and then you know, when I when I tell them, well, you know, that's that's not something that we offer. But you know, there's plenty of ways to trade currencies. They just actually don't want to really listen. Um, you know, they they re they really want those pairs. All right, and with that, I think we will we will close out the old trading block, and we will dive right into the odd block. The odd block. And welcome to the Odd Block, and you can tell by all of our chuckling that we have very bizarre intermissions here. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the Odd Block, obviously this is the segment of the show where we discuss unusual things, even more unusual than the mini metals. Today we're going to start off with Regis RGS, and this one closed at 1858, up about 23 cents. 
And this is one has a little interesting, little interesting narrative to go along with it. This company started shopping around looking for some takeovers. I think a few months ago, back in August, is when that stuff started. And then, of course, they got their legs kind of chopped out from underneath them when the New York Post leaked the story that the bids they were actually getting were substantially lower than they had hoped in the mid to low teens. So uh, the stock just gapped back down after that. And then, of course, yesterday into yesterday's session, they came in with an explosion. They did over 16,000 options when their average daily volume is less than 1,000. 15,900 of those were calls. So you had a 43... 43 to 1 call to put ratio. 12,000 of those, of those 16,000 was the, uh, the D's 20s. You know, I know why all this happened. Rumor leaked that, um, there was a possibility that, uh, my wife might start going to supercuts as opposed to a regular <laughs> salon. You know, that's gonna at least add two or three cents per share to, uh, underlying earnings of the stock. I thought this is where the mini metals got their hair cut. Yeah. They have a lot of hair. No. <laughs> no, you know, you know what Regis owns? Regis owns supercuts, all these, Crazy hair salons. And then do you know what else they own, Mark? I have no idea. I'm afraid you will enlighten me, though. Let me tell you, we're not just, we're not just a podcast. We're also members. They own Hair Club for Men. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, they own Hair Club for Men. And so, you know, it is interesting. There's heavy rumors out there, yeah, that, uh, you know, somebody still thinks that this is going to end up getting bought out at a better level because we saw somebody come in and buy – just a massive amounts of these. I believe the guy paid uh, about a 65 implied volatility, which was up 15 bucks yesterday, 15 points, uh, paying you know but 65 cents on uh, the D's 20s, which means he thinks it's going for at least 21, probably more like 22, 23, 24. Otherwise, that 65 cent purchase isn't really worth it. Um, but uh, you know, this is all speculation on them. The ta- any takeover being, you know, pretty imminent. So, uh, you know, which kind of makes sense. I think I think it's something that is ev- eventually going to happen. These guys want it to happen. Um, I have trouble imagining that it won't. So. Well, yeah, the bulk of the volume was Dece, so the people are thinking it's pretty short term. And even though the news coming out was pretty bad, the options activity was decidedly bullish. The bulk of these call buys were opening. They were on or lifting offers for most of them. So, yeah, these guys were definitely bullish on, on Regis for the short term. I think it's because of those commercials. Is, is that guy still around, the I'm not just the owner, I'm a, I'm a member guy? Yeah, no, Cy Sperling, I love that guy. No, he... I knew you would know the name. I knew it. Oh, I love that guy. <laughs> I tell you, if, we're yeah. ever, if I'm ever playing Trivial Pursuit and I get to pink, I'm calling you. Cause... There, thank you very much. But I... <laughs> He's your phone-a-friend guy if you ever go on the Millionaire Show. <laughs> it's... it's um, just uh, full disclosure, I actually wrote about this exact same trade for thestreet.com, uh, made the exact same joke about my wife in the article, and suggested that people buy these calls because uh, I think the D6, the D20s at 65 cents are a pretty cheap flyer on something that, that most of the market seems to think is going to happen. So, If you want to check out a more detailed write-up of this, you can check out the one Mark put up on thestreet.com. We also have a great... Uh, the guys over at LiveVol did a great write-up. It's on the Options Insider. You can go check it out under the Unusual Activity tab. They actually mm-hmm. walk you through how to analyze it with LiveVol as well. So a lot of interesting stuff going on there. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of eyeballs on Regis these days. Then we'll move on to another oddball one, which is suitable for the odd block, is Heinz, H.J. Heinz. These are the ketchup and all sorts of other condiment makers. They're $48.28. They close up about $0.53. Cents. And a lot of interest in them because they have earnings before they open tomorrow. What is interesting is that the Bulls are coming out to play. Apparently, ketchup is the place to be right now for some reason. I guess when you're looking at uh, uncertain economic times, people flock to condiments. Mm -hmm. It is a vegetable, isn't it? People like vegetables. It's a cheap way to get your servings for the day. Yeah. (laughs) Just pop the cap on a tub of Heinz and you're good for the day. Um, Yeah, Morgan Stanley (laughs) just upped upped their share price to uh, their target to $52. (laughs) From forty nine bucks, isn't that the Sebastian uh, health plan there? Well, yeah, I mean, th- well, they own they own A one as well. So I like to say, Heinz, it's how a portfolio is done. <laughs> <laughs> we need I need to reach out to the Heinz guys about sponsoring the show. This is this is now between our love for A one. I think everyone was rallying about how much they were just just bullish on A one, and now Heinz ketchup. We need to really get some sponsorship dollars. Don't worry, OX guys. You guys can still still sponsor the show, but we have to have a little Heinz segment, I think, just because there's mm-hmm. there's so much love for their products. I'm sure, Tim, you would agree with that. Yes. 
<laughs> and then maybe we'll start the show at 2.57. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right, and, yeah, what we saw was, not surprisingly, uh, so the Bulls were out in force in Heinz because everyone loves ketchup, and we saw some long-term Bulls coming in to Heinz here. We saw a, a trader coming in selling about 3,000 of the June 2011 40 puts for 55 cents. And then uh, he came out and bought a thousand. So he went, you know, he used them to finance his buy of a thousand June fifties for a buck forty-five. It's a net credit of twenty cents for after you, after you get the ratio there. And so yeah, he expects uh, Heinz to rally significantly. He's got to rally well north of fifty bucks to make this back. But obviously, this guy agrees with Morgan Stanley and thinks the future is indeed in ketchup and a one. What do you guys think about the future of condiments? Well, it's, it's an interesting trade if you're bullish. And, uh, you know, that's, this guy clearly is. I mean, it's not, it's, this isn't one of those, uh, really crazy, hey, well, I wonder what this guy is trying to figure out to do. It's just, you know, it just, it is what it is. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a bullish trade. So, uh, the guy likes, the guy likes Heinz. The guy likes his ketchup. Yeah, and if it's in tough economic times, like you had said, Mark, you can, you might not be able to afford the new car, you might not be able to afford the new washer and dryer, but by gosh, you can handle that free packet of ketchup at McDonald's or going out and buying the jumbo pack over at Costco or wherever. <laughs> it's the new staycation. Now, that's the new luxury is just, just loading up on ketchup at home. The staycation. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh. <laughs> the staycation. We're going to a dark, dark place now. But um, I think we're gonna have. We need to get a drop. We need to get drop with the word staycation so that we can we can drop that in whenever we're talking about uh, about something. Just that guy that goes staycation. Um, <laughs> All right, and then uh, switching gears again drastically, which is what we are what we are want to do here on the odd block. We're going to jump into Seagate, which is uh, STX. These are obviously the hard drive makers. They closed at uh, fourteen twenty-two, up about thirty cents. And these guys, this is where we saw the the three-legged spread come into play. Uh, we got another bull coming near term in Seagate. He came in and he bought essentially the Jan fifteen seventeen and a half call spread. Paid uh, ninety-nine cents for the fifteen, sold the seventeen halves for twenty-three cents, and he did that twenty-five hundred times. And then he turned around and financed the whole thing with a sell of the Jan 12 half puts for 61 cents. So that netted him out to 15 cents on the three-way spread. And he's looking at upside, obviously, after once the stock rallies up past 15, 15 or so by Jan expiration. Also, he's looking at picking up a quarter of a million shares on the downside if the stock drops to 12 half, though I'm guessing that doesn't really bother him, Guessing looking at the levels where he's putting this on. Mm-hmm. A pretty sizable trade in, in uh, Seagate. They usually do about 40,000 average daily volume. This, this one alone was 7,500 contracts. So today they're obviously up, up above their normal numbers, doing about 55,000 contracts today. And obviously another player who thinks, despite the influx of, of SSDs and flash drives, that there still is a future in these spinning disks and spinning hard drives because this guy is putting on a... Uh, a fairly bullish spread and financing it with an even b- more bullish sale of some downside puts. Well, it's just uh, it's just your common case of the fact that the neat thing about options is there are a billion ways to build a position. You know, there's there's 50 ways to leave your lover. There's 50,000 ways to build a bullish op- option position. <laughs> um, and that's one of the neat things about about options. They give you that flexibility, kind of do what you want. This guy is taking a, what I would call a pretty minimal uh, intermediate kind of financial risk. You know, he doesn't have a lot of, to worry about on the downside. Doesn't have to, doesn't really cost him a lot, um, and he can potentially make a killing if this thing uh, catches a, a bid. So it's uh, you know just your your, your classic classic uh, you know guy taking some time and building what he building a position using options to make things inexpensive. So. If you're comfortable at the levels you want to get into the equity on or the underlying on, and obviously this guy is, he's comfortable at that 12 half level, and you're still bullish on the stock, and you want to find a nice way to finance a nice bullish play like he did for 15 cents. I mean, this uh-huh. is, a, he guess he gets almost a free shot here, and he picks up the stock on the downside if he's wrong in the short term. So, yeah, not, not a bad way to structure a, a bullish bet on the cheap. Uh-uh. To stay in the tech really quick, we'll toss it to Yahoo, because these guys, Yahoo closed at 17 bucks, up about 85 cents. Their average daily volume is at 40,000 contracts. They did six times that today, almost a quarter of a million contracts. 
a bulk of this volume is was the Dees 1921 call spread. It went up mm-hmm. 21,000 times for 24 cents. Uh, so they, end up, they, added, they added more to that by the end of the day. It looks did they like add they more? Like, looks like they ended up doing about 35. Size bulls coming coming to play in Yahoo. Obviously, there's a lot of talks going on right now about people coming in to uh, to acquire Yahoo in various ways, shapes, and forms. But yeah, there's no there's no immediate uh, recent deal rumors that seem to be driving this spread. I think some people are speculating that it's just a, a pop based on a, some guy from News Corp coming over to the company. But other than that, yeah, it looks like just the bulls are coming in, putting on a cheap upside spread and positioning themselves in case these rumors heat up again out in Yahoo that these guys are ready to uh, guys are ready to play. Yahoo's a weird one because they've been all over the map the last couple of years. And a rumor comes out Microsoft's going to buy on the stock, gaps up and doubles. They say no, the stock's cut in half. They haven't found a way to make that back in a while. So they're they're kind of a weird company. Uh, I think Bing is running their search now and stuff. So a lot of weird a lot of weird stuff going on out there, mm-hmm. and they're trying to become a, a content company and seem to have, have ceded the territory on search to Microsoft and Bing. Well, it makes sense. I mean, Yahoo has been kind of a, the, the you know, not that great of a search engine for a pretty pretty long time. And, uh, you know, Bing Bing actually does almost, as, you know, as good of a job as Google with the times I've used it. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Um you know, I don't know if Microsoft ends up really ending up buying these folks. I don't know that that makes a ton of sense. But, um, you know, I, I definitely see where the value in a strategic partnership is. There's still a ton of people that go to Yahoo for email that, that go to Yahoo as a, a coagulant of news. You know, they're, Yahoo does for the entire world what the Option Insider does for option traders in, in many ways. Exactly, uh, but just not obviously not as good as the Option Insider. Well, uh, there are a few who can. There are a few who can. Well, they need to get a little more longoed. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I'd like to go longo uh, Yahoo, not long, longo. Isn't that just the case everywhere? Shouldn't that be everyone's <laughs> mantra? A little more longo yeah. for life. Yep. <laughs> Isn't that how you proposed to your wife? You said, "Don't you need a little more longo in your life?" <laughs> It works surprisingly well. I recommend everyone out there try it who's, uh, who's considering going down that road. Yeah, you know, and they, there's no reason for Microsoft to pick up Yahoo now. They've got the best part of the deal. They've got the search yep. and all the search ad stuff without buying anything. Yeah. They ended up lucking out on that deal after all. And we'll finish up the odd block with just a quick toss back to a name that John Griegas actually brought up last week on the show, uh, Mela Science is M-E-L-A. We talked at the time about how this thing was just – bid out of control they were doing some boxes out there trying to take advantage of some of the uh, some of the cost of carry issues that were going on out there and it was it was a nine days to go a six dollar stock they were coming up on an fda announcement on tuesday of this week this past tuesday and the at the money straddle was trading for four dollars it was insane the twelve dollar calls you know hundred percent out of the money calls with nine days to go were trading 25 cents it was just a uh, premium seller's dream but it also could become a a premium seller's nightmare very quickly because you just didn't know where the hell this thing was going based on the FDA announcement. The thing could rally to 12. It could gap down to zero based on them cutting cutting the legs out of it. And it looks like that's exactly what happened. The FDA came out and said their skin cancer device was no good and their study was no good. So uh, the stock got this, got his legs chopped out. It's down to about $2.52 now. So if you sold that $4 straddle, you're still pretty much about, you, about break even maybe. Mm-hmm. Actually, we don't know where it is right now because it looks like it's halted because they're arguing in front of the FDA advisory panel right now. So it looks like it got halted at 252, but it might open up substantially lower because there's a lot of talk that they don't have the money to redo that study. So, yeah, it's an odd odd situation where you could sell a $4 straddle in a $6 stock with nine days to go and still have it cost you money. But uh, it looks like that might come to pass in, in that stock. Oh, you did it right. You sold the uh, the Nov the Nov sixes for two bucks though. Those or the Nov twelves for twenty five cents. Those were just too ridiculous. That was a great example of just a a crazy odd name and just some purely non fundamental vol driving those things up around that FDA mm-hmm. announcement. Yep. Yeah, and that's gonna uh, that's gonna close us out for the odd block, and we'll roll right into the express slash spread block. The Spread Block, brought to you by Options Express. 
Options Express lets you trade futures and now foreign futures too, where and when you want. From advanced charting and free daily trading ideas to automated systems trading and free educational resources, Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Visit OptionsExpress.com to open your free account. Futures involve substantial risk and are not appropriate for all investors. Please read this disclosure statement for futures and options available at OptionsExpress.com slash futures risk or by calling 1-888-280-8020 prior to applying for an account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. Welcome to the Express slash Spread Block, and this is where the boys over at Options Express regale us with all the interesting stories about what's lighting up their phone banks today. And Tim, if I had to take a guess on what is filling your day today, I would have to say GM. Am I correct? No, it no, was no, all no, about no, 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 no. It, it was. Uh, let me guess. Let me guess. It was um, penny stocks. Doc. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's uh, yeah. that's pretty much what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. All morning long. I mean, this was uh, one of the busiest days that we've had in, a, in quite a long time. Um, I mean, we were really backed up on the phones, and uh, everybody just wanted to buy GM. Um, period. You know, I couldn't take enough phone calls of, of people buying GM, asking about when our options going to be available on it. Um, and, you know, over the last, I would say, two weeks, too, it was Ford, you know. So, uh, you know, people really have been playing this automotive uh, sector for quite some time now. And, you know, finally they got what they wanted. They got the they got the GM. Did you get any especially good fills that you're very proud of? Did you get any, like, 33 or 33 10, <laughs> anything like that? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I was looking for them, uh, and I was hoping for some people to, you know, bid down there. Um, but, no, they were just stepping in right where it was and buying it, period. Yep. Yeah, it looks like it kind of opened uh, opened fairly strong. Well, IPO to 33, opened to 35, and then it seemed to retreat off those levels. I'd be a put buyer on GM. That's just me. So, mm -hmm. and not not because I think they're going bankrupt or anything like that, but I just think, uh, you know, there's a little too much excitement into this IPO, and this may go kind of the standard IPO path where, you know, it's a little lower a year later. So that's kind of that's what I kind of am looking at when I look at uh, General Motors. Yeah, if I had to do a spread of uh, you know Ford or GM or pick one of the two, I would I would definitely lean Ford right now. They seem to have the edge, like like all the things we were talking about. They've gone the in the cockpit route, and that's increasing their sales price, and seems to be increasing their sales. Meanwhile, GM still has a lot of union issues, and they still have they've been cutting lines, but I'm not sure if they're cutting the right lines. Right, and have you and have you read about the kind of the way the union is just milking this IPO? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not anti-union. My father-in-law is a union guy, a teach in the teachers' union. Love unions, but what? The United Auto Workers are doing to the, getting out of this GM IPO is <laughs> astounding. The way they're just milking cash out of this thing, um, you know, it makes me wonder what what kind of. Uh, it, it makes me worried that you know once they're done milking this, what what do they have left? Uh, you know, the point of this whole GM deal was to get them on board and and turn General Motors into kind of a partnership. The way they're milking this thing is is does not. You know, I, I have trouble seeing how it can form a partnership. So that, that's just kind of what I would say about that. I guess I'm kind of viewing this, and, and I'm in agreement with you on that, Mark, but the thing that a sound, they've, the government's bailed them out once, and governments typically aren't in the business of admitting that they make mistakes. So the one thing that I think could be a good thing for GM is that if they get into trouble again and the government, they have the, the – the government's done it before, they can go to the government again for a bailout. Now, for our clients, this is kind of what we refer to as a stretch Wachorski trade. We won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think just to the upside, the one thing that they would have going for them is that they have Big Brother seems to be on their side. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll be interested. Big Brother may not always be there would be the one thing I would say. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a feeling that if we got uh, – 
the new, uh, the governor of New Jersey in there, um, GM would have would have gone to uh, auction. That's my theory. Yeah. Yeah. Now I don't think they're going to go bankrupt. I think that if anything, you know, they're you know they've solved a, a lot of a, a good chunk of their issues. Um, but you know, I just don't think that uh, you know. I, I think four is the better the better play. That would be what I would say. Uh, Agreed. You know. That, that and it's just simple like that. Why would you buy GM when you can buy Ford? Did you get any calls for Ford today, Tim? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, no, I didn't. Um, I didn't. But uh, like I said before, probably over the last two weeks, three weeks, uh, everybody was bought Ford. Yeah. And you know, uh, since yeah. this is an option show, we should reiterate or, or mention that I believe the options are opening what the 29th on GM. Yes. Oh, nice. Excited for that. I am excited yes. for that. But, yeah, so, Tim, uh, anything else going on uh, over at OX? Not too much. You know, like I said before, people are um, sort of gearing up on some of the Black Friday um, stocks, you know, Amazon, Walmart, Best Buy. Um, people are, you know, starting to get um, SRI. SIRI uh, is one that, that's sort of creeping in here. Um, I see some activity on that as well. That's serious radio. Um, because I think Howard Stern is supposed to be, uh, making his decision on whether or not he's staying or leaving or something like that. Uh, that's not yeah. one that I pay too much attention to, but that, that's sort of coming up on the screen. So if he bought some puts before he got his contracts, that guy had stock. Well, I forgot what level he got it at, but he got stock obviously higher than a buck 40 where it is now. Yeah, right. I would, yeah, no kidding. I, I this is a lose lose situation for Siri because they serious you know, they can't afford to pay Howard Stern and without Howard Stern they basically have no reason to exist. Um yeah. beyond Howard Stern. Um why would any you know, pretty soon with all the internet capabilities of cars, you're gonna be able to get podcasts and uh, you know, radio via different type of uh podcast apps, uh, as easily as you can get Sirius satellite radio and the only thing that is keeping that company viable is is the Howard Stern content, in in my general my opinion. Yeah, that's a buck forty of Howard Stern premium right there. That is a buck forty I would sell if he gets that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, podcast. Look at this one. I mean, we can get a fair number of listeners without having any sort of sign up fee, any sort of hardware you have to buy, and that that model is really what's killing the satellite radio. There's no reason. Oh, yeah. to buy hardware. Well, it's, it's it's killing terrestrial radio, which is free. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, on terrestrial, there's no way they could could be as interesting, exciting as we are here on uh, the option block. You know. <laughs> Imagine how interesting and exciting we would be if we had a subscription fee. Oh wow, the things we could do. <laughs> we could have official intros from Mini Metals. <laughs> uh, they should be our house band. <laughs> All right, and with that, we will close out this segment of the Express Block. And we will move right into the interview block. The interview block. Welcome back to the interview block. And this is the segment of the show where once a week we like to grab some esteemed luminary from the world of options and then pick their brain for a few minutes, and then Mark will toss them a few really weird questions, and then we'll close it out. And uh, today's victim is Henry Schwartz. He is the founder and CEO of Trade Alert. Henry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. For those of our listeners who are saying, that voice sounds familiar, Henry has been on Options Insider Radio many times in the past, and he is, in fact, the first guest to make the jump to the dark side, so to speak, and come on to the option block as well. For the few listeners out there who haven't probably heard your appearances in the past, Henry, why don't you give our listeners a quick rundown of what you guys do over at Trade Alert and what's trading? Sure. Uh, um, Trade Alert is a market data vendor. We process uh, the full opera feed and stock market feeds in real time and uh, basically uh, process the data and aggregate it to help people really get a handle on uh, qualitative and quantitative aspects of what's trading so uh taking things further than just okay there's a big block of calls in alcoa that traded to actually saying okay how did they trade was it 
uh, in the form of a sweep where somebody lifted the offer on a bunch of floors. What did it do to the implied volatility? What was the net market impact in terms of stock delta? Uh, that kind of stuff. And then even on a higher level, uh, we do a lot of nice things with uh, aggregating the activity across a stock over multiple days or even across an entire sector. So you can say, okay, well, hey, what does the flow look like in the material sector today anyway? Uh, and you can get a nice picture of, of, of things that way. Henry, uh, Mark Sebastian here. Um, Hi. How you doing? Good. So what would you say that, you know, I'm sure you get a ton of feedback from your customers. What would you say that they find to be kind of the most valuable service that you guys really offer? And uh, do you hear a lot of uh, things? I'm sure you hear all the time about things that they're clamoring for. Uh, what is on your short list of things that the trade alert is quickly trade alert slash what's trading is looking to uh, to bring to the table? Um, the uh, it's a good question. The probably one of the the earliest uh, uses of data that people got really excited about was was these very simple unusual volume alerts. Uh, when uh, you look at a stock and it normally trades 7,000 contracts a day, and then all of a sudden by noon something's traded 17,000 contracts, uh, that usually means there's something happening, uh, or sometimes it means something's about to happen. So that that you know very quickly got us a lot of interest uh, because it was very hard to kind of see that unless you were lucky enough to be looking at the right place when things were trading. Um, in terms of future things, it's actually really just a, an evolution of that. Uh, we're actually moving to a time-weighted, market-weighted uh, analysis of volume, meaning if something trades 10,000 contracts a day, then on average it trades about 1,500 contracts an hour. So if by 1130 something's traded 5,000 contracts, it's already ahead of schedule, basically. Mm -hmm. so now, are you, are, oh, sorry. No, sorry. No, and I was just going to say what you can actually add to that is a market weighting, meaning if the entire market is very, very busy, uh, you can divide by how busy the market is. Uh, or mm -hmm. if the market's very slow, if the market's only trading half of its normal daily volume, but some stock is actually trading more than its average daily volume, uh, that's an additional uh, piece of information. And, it, and it's, it's a very intelligent way to, to look at it and say, wow, this thing should only have traded – you know, 4,300 contracts at this moment, and it's traded 7,000, so something's going on. So basically just trying to help people see these things even earlier. Well, that's really that's really useful and interesting. Now, are you guys going to apply some sort of weighting to the actual times? I mean, we all know that, um, you know, a huge chunk of the volume happens in the first hour and the last hour. So uh, is there any plan in the works to kind of take that weighting uh you know, even a step further. That we we've already got it. We've got the data crunched, and you're you're exactly right. The, it's not a linear uh, progression of volume across the day. Uh, in fact, it's it's. I've been looking at a graph of it. The, the first half hour is actually slower than it than it would be, and then the next hour is busy, and then it's quiet for the middle couple a couple hours, and then uh, about two fifteen till four o'clock is when you get uh, a, a larger portion of the volume. So that's exactly it, and, and that's. That's kind of exciting because then, you know, as the market moves around and, you know, month after month, we actually update that averaging on a daily basis so that if if in the fall you get more market activity in the morning hours, uh, we can have our, our uh, alerts and analytics reflect that. Cool. That's really cool. And now for our people who are listening at home who want to you know, participate in this slew of data from Trade Alert, you guys have a couple of different options, right? They can... They can do the professional level over at Trade Alert, which I believe is around the 400 level, and then you also have the the premium membership over at Watch Trading, which is which is 89, which is kind of a little more of a a bite sized thing where people can come in and get some information on unusual activity and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, that's right. We're we're Trade Alert is is basically the institutional service. Uh, we're in you know our, our customers are typically the investment banks that are that are uh, trading most of the volume. Uh, and also brokers and uh, proprietary trading shops. And then the, the what's trading.com site is basically uh, a little bit more simplified, but still the same focus. It's really still about trying to uh, see activity as it's going on and interpret it uh, you know, very quickly. So, uh, and between those two, it, it works pretty well. The, um, you know, the, the what's trading.com basically gets the, 
the analytics and the information that is kind of uh, most easily used by you know active traders and and retail, uh, and um, and then the, the the institutional product is is designed for kind of people that are staring at their screens all day long. Yeah, all those people who love AIM. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One other thing that's in the works, which is uh, we're, we're alpha testing right now, is a, an option flow dashboard, which is even a step above the uh, the current institutional product. Uh, basically, it, it it's a dynamic dashboard that that show you know visually depicts kind of what where the volume is and uh, directionally and in volatility sense uh, and in uh, volume over over that funky time weighted market weighted number. Uh, mm -hmm. get, lets you get a handle on kind of what's going on. So that's uh, it works. We haven't rolled it out to too many people yet, but uh, that'll be coming uh, early next year. That's really cool. Um, yeah, no, your service is, is is I think something really valuable. I don't think people understand how valuable a lot of retail to clients, especially, don't understand how valuable um, understanding paper flow. And big trades is. Can you just give uh, you know kind of the average person? Why do you think that this information is so valuable to your clients? Why do people like me clamor for people like you? And it's beyond the fact that I have a thing for guys with buzz cuts in 1950s uh, Drew Carey glasses. That's not what I have. Um, <laughs> you must be talking about Longo. Um, the uh, <laughs> The, I got rid of the buzz cut a long time ago. So I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just the, kidding. The, uh, the, the need that we really kind of help out with is, is the when you have a highly automated, highly fragmented market like ours with nine exchanges and more and more of that volume getting sliced up you know, with, with smart routing, uh, if you don't have a tool to help you notice that 600 calls just traded but it was split up into – uh, you know, 780 lots, uh, it's really hard to know what is going on. And, you know, in the olden days, you could call the floor and say, hey, what just traded in Microsoft? Mm -hmm. But now there's, now there's really not anybody to call. And so, uh, you know, so the tools that we started building were basically just to get people, you know, a, a decent handle on what was trading and how. Um, and, um, and then for the larger trades and, and the funkier stuff, uh, and, and this is actually what shows up in, in what's trading more than not, than not is, uh, you know, with a couple people that, that have experience looking at the, the data that's, that's coming across the tape, uh, you can, you can, and actually also pulling in some ancillary data, uh, which might be talking to other traders or brokers, uh, we can help clarify. We can say, okay, you know what, this, you know, this very large risk reversal or collar traded in KSS, and this is what it's related to. Uh, and this is the economics of it, and you know, and yes, it suggests a very a very bearish view, or no, it does not. It's purely a volatility trade. It's purely a skew trade, that kind of a thing. So, uh, helping people figure that stuff out, uh, you know, in the course of a of a trading day when you got you know 15 million contracts trading and everybody's busy, mm -hmm. uh, it definitely is a, is a is a sweet spot because it lets people kind of you know get back to business, whether it's trading or or servicing accounts. Uh, because they know they can say, yeah, you know what? We just saw a big sweep of uh, puts being lifted in, you know, three different financials over the same five-minute period. Uh, we think somebody is, uh, you know, you know, making moving some money out of the sector and want to they want to hedge or something like that. You know, one of the reasons we like we like Henry's stuff over at Options Insiders because you get a nice kind of macro view of all the exchange stuff as well that you like you mentioned, you know, you get to see where the flow is really coming from, you know, outside of OCC and OIC numbers and those sorts of things. Uh, so you can kind of see the, the market share data on a much more real time, much more active perspective. You can see if people are doing are are having any sort of uptake to new entrants, like let's say the C two and that sort of thing. So that's we like to uh, to look at your numbers for that sort of stuff as well. Kind of a more real time parsing of what's actually going on in the options industry as opposed to what you're hearing from all the various press releases and that sort of thing. But Henry, you know, we love having you on. I'm glad I'm glad Mark tracked you down. Our show's running a little bit long today, so we're going to have to 
we could talk for another probably half an hour about a variety of different option flow things. But oh, we'll come on. We could talk for another five hours about options. <laughs> sure. We talk about flow of all types on this show, options being just one of them. But, well, uh, if you think well, Sebastian, exciting, no, I should If say. you think this is exciting, we got to get Henry to come on and talk about uh, his uh, Scrabble, his professional Scrabble league that he's in. He only does that when he's wearing his Drew Carey glasses, remember? He yes, takes those exactly. Off, Drew Carey glasses, buzz cut, and professional That's... Scrabble ability. This is our way here on the option <laughs> block. We invite guests in, and then we insult them. <laughs> and then insult them the whole time. That's fine. I don't mind. <laughs> Please come back at your earliest convenience, Henry. Still <laughs> more. <laughs> no, but actually, we, we enjoyed having you on. We'd like to have you on again. But for now... Henry, I'm glad you can come on, and we'll definitely have to bring you on again in a future episode. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Thanks, Henry. Sure. Around the Block. And welcome to Around the Block. This is a segment of the show we discuss what's on the tape for the next few sessions. And a lot of crazy stuff's been going on out there these days with Ireland and everything else. So what are you guys watching for the next few sessions? I know, Mr. Sebastian, you're, uh, you've got your eye focused on time decay around Thanksgiving these days. That's correct. You know, um, one of the things I think, uh, one of the kind of the more sophisticated traders love to get into is premium selling, where they collect this data. It's the kind of the concept that, you know, I'm going to win if nothing happens. Well, they look around here and say, wow, this is a great time where basically nothing happens around Thanksgiving. Um, sans Dubai, obviously. Um, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is market makers aren't stupid. And what we like to do when I was on the floor was we like to sell a bunch of premium ahead of the people that are coming in to sell premium. Okay? So we actually lower the vo- – we actually will go in and – you know, you'll see big institutional paper that do, doing this. You'll see smart retail paper coming in, and then you'll see the market makers coming in and just kind of selling premium to get to kind of price out. You know, the weekend before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving that half day and that weekend after Thanksgiving, kind of out ahead of time as quickly as they can. So, why is that important to understand? Well, if you're one of these guys who's who's planning on selling a bunch of premium tomorrow and thinking that you're going to have a ton of money in your pocket um, on Friday, uh, uh, next Friday, uh, you're going to be sorely disappointed when the market does nothing and you don't make very much because we've already priced out all of that lack of volatility. Um, you know, you can see this in the patterns in the VIX. I mean, I'm not a big, I don't, I'm not a lover of the VIX, but I'll tell you the one thing it's good for is kind of telling you premium selling patterns. And you can see that, you know, we're a full point lower than the last time we were at 11.98 less than a week ago, and that's because people are selling ahead of Thanksgiving. So it's something that I really think people need to, to be understanding and mindful of is that uh, premium decay is not a linear constant thing. All right, theta increases, but it also doesn't come out linearly. It doesn't come out, well, I made 100 bucks a day today, I'm going to make 110 tomorrow. No, you might make two or 300 bucks in a day. They like to get ahead of things. So that would be kind of my, my uh, little thought of the day uh, for around the block. Maybe we should change the name of the show then to Time Decay is Not Linear. What do you think? Is that, is that catchy? Okay. Would we get a lot of hits I in think, iTunes? I, I, I think that uh, maybe uh, it's good to be Longo Theta. What about that? <laughs> that's that's far that's much better i like it i like it. that'll get us huge huge seo huge huge clicks in itunes i love it that's good. i agree what about you two guys i know tim and mike you guys are the commodity hounds so i'm sure you're 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 watching gold and silver and tim probably cotton for you right i'm curious to see what happens on black friday i always like watching uh the news the day after the th- after Thanksgiving to see just how intense it was, so to speak. And uh, are you like uh, Gregus? You like to watch all the mayhem and bloodshed, or are you looking for a more economic fix? More on the economic side, although the, the bloodshed does sound kind of entertaining. I've never actually done that before, so maybe I got something to do this Friday. Well, my wife's out, hopefully not spending us out of house and home. But um, yeah, I, I think Black Friday. You know, you have the expectations of it, and I think that's going to kind of set the tone for uh, a lot of things in December, quite frankly. 
Well, we still got another week for Black Friday, so we're looking yeah. good there. Yeah, we know we talked a, a while ago about retail sales versus Black Friday, and I, I think I kind of came down on, on the side that Black Friday is retail sales right now. And you turned out to be right, because retail mm-hmm. sales was a yawner. Yeah, you know, who's watching that when everyone's waiting to uh, to stampede their neighbor for a flat screen TV or an Xbox in a week? <laughs> That's when we'll see the, the, true, uh, the true rubber meet the road, so to speak. What about you, Tim? Yeah. <clears throat> um, some of the things that uh, I do see a lot of are people, you know, participating in some of the Black Friday stocks. Uh, Amazon, Walmart are two of them, Best Buy, um, in addition to, again, you know, gold, silver, and, and oil. Um, you know, people, I think, have gotten kind of a jolt, um, you know, from cotton. Um, so I think, you know, a majority of people right now are sort of stepped back from that, trying to sort of see if it's going to sort of stabilize here, catch some support. Um, same thing with, you know, the euro. Um, so that's pretty much what I'm seeing here. All right, and with that, we will close out this episode of the Option Block. Become a part of the Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash optionblock or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated, all rights reserved.